CNF Worldwide for nomads everywhere. And we're starting now because Dan just clapped. <clears throat> hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Rick Carter from CNF Worldwide, and we're coming to you today from a, a very rainy wheeling West Virginia. But that isn't going to stop us from eating tacos and drinking beer and talking about uh, entrepreneurs and small business here. So we're here today at Taco Holics. Our, our friend Dave over here is a proprietor of Taco Holics. And then we've got Josh from Brew Keepers because we're drinking their beer. <laughs> and we've got Ashley and Dan from. Um, I'm going to screw this up. Back me up. Give me a second. One, two, three. Ashley and Dan from Wheeling Threads. Good to see you guys. So. CNF, we travel all over the United States, and our goal is to promote small businesses, small towns, the small economy, as we call it. And what we have here today is three examples of young entrepreneurs who are running businesses here in Wheeling. So I'm going to start with you, Dave. Um, can you give us a little bit of the backstory and tell us how you came up with the idea for Taco Hall? Yeah, sure. We, my wife and I were uh, tired of working corporate jobs and wanted to pursue things we were passionate about. So she went back to grad school. And I got a food truck. I wanted to sell tacos in Wheeling, you know, uh, get the tacos in a market where they don't exist outside of Taco Bell, fast food tacos, whatever. So um, also wanted to put a local twist on that to make, you know, make it more relatable for local people. So it's like street tacos with a high value twist. Um, started looking into lots and there were no landlords really entertaining temporary occupancy leases. Uh, the lots that we were targeting, they were asking the same for what we can get brick and mortar for. So literally we're paying $50 more a month in rent. Now there's more overhead, mind you, but uh, $50 more a month just for the rent to be in brick and mortar, have other revenue streams and a warm, welcoming place for people to eat, eat the food that we make. So now, did you or your wife have, have a hospitality or food service background before you decided? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's how we paid our way through college. Uh, you know, I was, I dropped out and went back to college and worked in food service the whole entire time. We're talking like spanning like nine, nine, ten years almost. Uh, you know, and then went into another service related industry is uh, business process outsourcing. It's not, you know, not very exciting stuff, very much, much more rigid conversations, if you will, but, um, you know, it's, it, the service industry is something that, that I'm always uh, sort of gravitating towards. So, <clears throat> at what, how long has Tacoholics been here in this this site here now? Uh, well, this is a site that we opened and we've been here a little over a year and a half, so since June 2017. So how, so how have you guys been received here in Uh Mixed, mixed uh, responses, honestly. Uh, most people that come in with an open mind appreciate it. We still get people that are like, hey, do you just have a regular taco? Uh, and they don't mean like, Carnitas or any of these, you know, chorizo. They mean uh, ground beef <laughs> on a soft shell with cheese and lettuce. So we do have one on the menu that's it's uh, pretty close to that uh, to to kind of appease that. But um, we we like to do things differently and then try to expand people's horizons as far as street tacos go. That's going to say. So you, do you just hand them over a, a ground beef taco, or do you try to take that opportunity to educate them that right. there's more to a taco than just ground beef? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we you know we we get a little spiel. This is these are our twist on a taco uh, we do have one similar to that but you know do you like a cuban sandwich for example we got a cuban sandwich on taco do you like pork kielbasa and crown for polish or german you know uh try to try to get some foods that people grew up with that they can relate to and experience it in that format so to speak so we're here we're here here at your restaurant you got the tacos and you got a nice beer selection here too yep. and uh, a lot of the beers here on tap are from brew keepers I got Josh over here. So, so Josh, can you give us a little background on Brewkeepers and how you guys came to be? Sure. Um, so, uh, my partners and I, Kevin and Carolyn Ayers, um, we we're friends, um, and they met me through a, a uh, well, not just the bar I worked at, but somebody that worked with me. So, they, so they were like friend of a friend, you know. And uh, we just we just started talking about stuff. I didn't know that that Kevin knew how to brew beer or or did that sort of thing, you know, but we always talk about alcohol. They like the way I make cocktails and stuff like that. And then he just invited me up to, to brew a beer one day. And uh, like, I, like we just sat there and drank beer and we actually brewed a, well, it, I'm more, I, I watched and brew beer. It was a dry Irish stout, which ended up being pretty good. Um, but after that, I was just hooked. Like, and um, the way I am, if I sink my teeth into something, and if I really get interested in something, then I just I will I will uh, I'll study 
everything about it, every aspect of it, you know. So I really wanted to um, learn everything I could about making beer. And um, so we just, we homebrewed uh, like twice a week, uh, every week for years. And um, So how many years? Uh, total, I've been brewing for almost seven, I think. Kevin's more like 20. Uh, he started when he was younger in oh, oh, Ohio. You know, when it wasn't even, homebrewing wasn't even a really big thing then. It's something that him and his dad did well, for bonding time, I guess. I don't know. And I, I ask how long, because we've interviewed a lot of craft brewers in recent months, and almost all of them had been homebrewing for quite a while. Sure. Before they took the, the leap into to trying to do it for a living, it's it's really not brewing beer is really not something that uh, you, uh, unless you're using a kit with instructions, it's not really that easy. Like I mean, everything everything matters. Like the proportion of your grains, um, everything that you put in beer also has a flavor aspect to it, including the water and the yeast. You know, and everything has to kind of play nice together for, for you to make a good beer. You know. So I mean, it, it does take, a, a, I think, a great amount of time kind of honing recipes and making mistakes the biggest thing you, and best thing you can do um, because if you don't make mistakes, you don't really learn anything. You know, so making bad beer ultimately makes you a good brewer. You know? So as our conversation before we went on the air here, anything you're really good at, you probably screwed up at least one time. So, oh, okay. so you made some bad batches of beer sure. on your way to making some really great batches of beer. Right. So, so now, how long has Brewkeepers been been around as a an actual commercial business? Uh, we opened our doors officially in July of 2016. So we're going to be coming up on three years here uh, pretty soon. Um, I mean, our, our reception at Wheeling has been very, very good, um, and. I think that is a, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, because we're very accommodating to um, our clients, and we want to make sure that we keep uh, like that hometown small batch feel. And uh, we we like to let people know that we are taking care of Wheeling first and foremost before we do or go anywhere else. So speaking yeah. of Wheeling and beer, yeah. before we went on the air here, you were telling me a little bit of Wheeling history. About, about you know the breweries that were here before, so you can repeat that for for our listening audience here. Tell us a little bit about the history of beer and wheeling. Sure. You well, I, I mean, as far as as far as I know, or I can tell, you know, um, in the in the late 1700s to the, the early and mid 1800s, um, wheeling was the, the gateway to the West. It was it was the furthest west anybody well, that was civilized okay <laughs> so <laughs> you use that term loosely then <laughs> yeah, so, I mean yeah you should use that term loosely when it comes to well, wheeling in general but I'm saying no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, but anyway, um, but so there, because of the river uh, great uh, transportation from you know state to state even all the way out to like east coast so so um, the, the breweries here did a lot of distribution to, to the East Coast, or what we, we knew as America you know, at, at the time. And as, as America moved west, um, you know, Wheeling got you know, less and less important in that, in that aspect, especially with, with brewing beer, because you know, breweries are popping up all over, all over the river as we you know, move west. Uh, so uh, around, around the turn of the 20th century, there were only uh, two, I think, two breweries left in Wheeling, and then it just kind of just dropped off, the, like the map, just with the population goes down, you know, like the, you know, work changed around here, um, the population became less dense, um, there were, you know, uh, prohibition happened. Uh, stricter alcohol laws. We call those the dark years. Right. Well, yeah. West, West Virginia <laughs> enacted prohibition in uh, 1918, two years before the rest of the nation, because of bootlegging and moonshining and stuff like that. And uh, it, it, we've been suffering. Our, our state's been suffering ever since that. When it comes to alcohol laws, so there, a lot of them are antiquated, and yeah, it, it's, it's really hard to for uh, let's say like a small brewery or distillery or anything like that to kind of like cut through that red tape or um, just the restriction is, is incredible sometimes. But we are making great strides so when, it, when it comes to craft beer and alcohol. The research I've done on you guys, you guys basically, it's you guys distribute 
and I could come to your place and get a crowler or a growler filled. Right. Um, you don't really have a tap room, eatery, that kind of thing. Not it's yet, we're working on it right now. Gotcha, gotcha. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, next couple of months we'll have our tap room open. Um, and we'll but, be back. All right. <laughs> Love to have you. So, uh, I'm going to come over to our guys here at Wheel and Threads, Dan and Ashley. Um, went online, looked at your site, very cool. Love your logo. Looked at a bunch of the shirts you guys have out there. Tell us a little bit about how you guys came up with the idea to start Wheel and Threads. You know, man, it was, I always say this, it was completely in it for uh, her and I, we, we worked together at the same place that are 9 to 5, and it was not last Christmas, the Christmas before, we had an internal design contest, and the, the proceeds of this design contest, uh, well, rather, the winner of the design would be placed on shirts printed and sold, and all the proceeds were to be given to uh, the soup kitchen of Greater Wheeling. So, uh, my design won my landslide. No, I don't know. I was a close second. <laughs> yeah, <Susan>. <laughs> <laughs> I was a close second. And it, it was we, cool. We will research the results of this and get back to you. It's close for a distant second. We'll get back. <laughs> and basically, what had happened is when my design won, I utilized a, basically a, a legend in our city. His name is Charles Waldrum. Uh, a lot of folks call it, his nickname. His name is his nickname is Moon Dog, and I utilize the likeness of him. I got his permission and everything like that. And when it when the shirt started production, I was thinking to myself, okay, yo, this is really cool. Like you know, 25, 30, maybe 40 shirts, you know, with my arts. And uh, when the social media link went live to purchase and such, I was like, yeah, it's really cool. And I. I shared it and such, and uh, on all of my outlets, my professional work page, and so on. I woke up the next day, I had never seen like social media interaction like this in reference to me. I was like, well, this is it's clearly a mistake, clearly, clearly, clearly. And it was just like thousands of interactions and comments and uh, things like that. There's news outlets reaching out to um, us and me in particular, and I'm just like completely beside myself. Like. I, I've always been involved with local projects, working with businesses, individuals, and ideas around here, but nothing on that level. And as time progresses, um, you know, ultimately the fundraiser ends, and we had sold over 600 shirts. Nice. Like with my art, uh, raising a total of it was over six thousand five hundred dollars for the soup kitchen. Like, How do you beat this? You know, what I mean, uh, this is incredible, and just. My exposure alone was just awesome. My head was spinning. I'd never been a part of anything like that. And uh, everything died down, and it was still, you know, it was cool, and it was fun, and I had the rights of the art regardless. And um, sincerely, man, I was laying in bed one evening. I, I got to make something work with this. And it just hit me. I was like, why am I do this in my sleep? You know what I mean? I, what the t-shirt design really showed me is Wheeling's uh, togetherness and basically consistency to get together and support such a, a local legend uh, such as Charles and things like that and what really wowed me is everybody they, they love the art because it was Wheeling centric and uh, so when it hit me I was like I, there's ton, there's amazing history just across the board almost infinite supplies of, of things that I could create or recreate um, get my hand on you know that nostalgic feeling that we were talking about earlier and such and uh, as how I talked to her about it the next day I was like what do you think about this she was like yeah man that sounds great I was like obviously I'm gonna make you you know do stuff do this with me you don't have a choice and um, this was I want to say really want to say ma'am this is in late January early February I ended up buying the domain I told everybody I was like this is gonna be live by spring and I pushed it on March 1st uh, we took that month in between uh, the release, um, the release date of the domain, to conjure up a couple designs, and uh, just push go. And I, out of nowhere, I just out of the gates, like this is great, and so on. And we had only been two months old when we were, um, you know, in the final four of like the show of hands, that crowdfunding um, event that I was speaking about. And kind of never looked back since, man. Just continuously create, try to at least 
create one new piece or you know, one new product a week, keep people on their toes. So I'm going to cut to you now and go, uh, what was your response when he basically told you you were drafted and you were in this business <laughs> and this, this was happening, so I start creating stuff. Um, I was absolutely excited about it. I mean, he's a phenomenal artist and I know when he puts his mind to something, like it's, it's going to be big and it certainly was. Like, I, I knew the excitement. He couldn't contain himself when he's like, okay, this is what we're going to do and this is, this is our game plan and all this and that. And we just hit the floor just running, like sprinting, basically, and launched everything. And we still are sprinting, it feels like. We just keep releasing and keep putting out new things, keep coming up with new ideas and, and things like that. So, so you guys still cranking out a new idea every week? I went it's to your site. Like yeah. You have a lot of shirts and stuff out there. You yeah, know. considering yeah. we're not even a year old yet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, it, and just as I said previous, sky's the limit with that. Uh, there, there are so many things that are under the radar and that are forgotten about. And we do, we dig a lot of research. And we also have a sketchbook that is just packed to the max with just, you know, pencil line art. That, that's our process. We take everything as a sketch first and we take it digitally. So it's going to be nonstop like this until uh, one of us dies. <laughs> So no, I'm gonna pop back over here to Dave. So we got all three of you guys have started businesses here in the past relatively short number of years. What can you describe for us the process of getting it started? Like how how did you do a business plan? Where did you go for funding? How did you put the whole thing together to actually get the business open? Yeah, I didn't do a business plan. No, I'm just kidding. We, uh, it's, it's, so it's something that I've wanted to do for a very long time. Um, you know, this this kind of transformed into a much bigger business plan than we initially intended. With just a food truck, just selling lunch and breakfast. Uh, you know, we actually don't even sell breakfast. We only sell lunch and dinner now. Um, but it's something that I've had in the works for a long time. It's because it's something that I want. I've always wanted a restaurant, always wanted a bar. Um, so... You know, to, to throw this one together in six months, uh, or to say that it was thrown together in six months is kind of facetious because all the ideas were there in other business plans that were working in my head, you know. I, I didn't have funding, right? I mean, I had a retirement plan and, you know, unfortunately got a life insurance check from my dad. So, like, that's, you know, that's how the, how the business got started. I had a little bit of uh, money to start it up. We started up extremely cheap for this business. Um, and you know, by the skin of our teeth, uh, because if we didn't start making money very shortly after we opened our doors, we weren't going to be here very long. Um, you know, it, it happened to work out. I mean, you know, be it luck, uh, be it hard work, or a combination of both. Uh, you know, I won't guess, but we've been very fortunate. Um, like I said, you know, I said we got mixed responses to the business, but that's just. Um, that's me being hypercritical of myself, right? Uh, overwhelmingly, it's a positive response to the business. And we get customers that are excited about a business that doesn't have TVs in it, you know, that has board games, promotes conversations between people. Um, really a different approach to the bar and restaurant game in Wheeling because I, I can only think of one other place that uh, doesn't have TVs and it's not a bar. They have a bar, but it's like two seats. And uh, so here it's a new concept, a bar that's not, doesn't double as a sports bar, right? Do, so do, do, you, do you think that there's a hunger for growing in people in this country or in this area for that kind of thing where you can go someplace and kind of unplug and yeah. actually interact with other people? I do, and I really believe that it's people who like good food and good beer. I think those are the kind of people that sit down and have conversations, um, you know, whether they're just sort of uh, enjoying the variety of the two, uh, skating along, or they're actually, you know, thinking about these things, like what makes this beer good? Um, you know, the food and the beer promote more conversations uh, outside of this place uh, than most things that I'm aware of, and maybe it's just because that's, that's my thing, you know what I mean? I hear it when it's spoken, but um, I, don't know, I feel like that's, that's uh, a conversation started in and of itself, and the people that appreciate sort of the finer beers um, are the type that like to sit down and have a conversation, cut loose with, with people, uh, not sit uh, staring at a TV for three hours and drinking 30 shitty beers, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what it is. So, yeah, not uh, to, I apologize. Different to shows for different folks. It's got its place, but, you know, we're, we're here for, for not that, not the sports bar thing. So jump into it. You, you say that, and I didn't even, it was just a, an afterthought. I just realized when you said that, this place doesn't have TVs, man. And I'm a, like, a strict, firm believer when, you know, it is dinner time or drink time or whatever, you know, you have to enjoy your company. You know, and it's, it is totally subconscious that, 
that's what this place brings. Man, goddamn genius. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's old school anyway. Yeah, yeah, you have, to, it, you have to snap a shot of the sign. This is a, if you need a jukebox or a TV to start a conversation, you're probably not interesting enough to be here. So. <laughs> you gotta, we, we, that, that's going to be one of the main pictures in this story. Excellent. Yeah, uh, you got to have at least one rude sign in a bar, you know? So. At least one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Josh, this, this similar question to you guys. At what point in time did you guys go, Man, these homebrew beers we're making, they're really good. Let's put together the plan for actually making this the way we make a living. Okay, well, so uh, when we came to that point, um, well, well um, when I was saying that, that Kevin and I would, would homebrew a couple times a week, we started off just making our own beers. Like, I'd make my beer and he'd make kids' beer and we'd help each other make our beers. Um, but it wasn't until we started collaborating on beers that we found that the beers we were collaborating on were better than them. It, it, well, better than our ideas independently. Right. When we brought them together, they were stronger. They were a uh, more complete idea of what we thought good beer was. And so we started doing that. Instead of doing our, our beers independently, we started collaborating on everything. And uh, we were getting to the point, uh, we were part of the, a, a local uh, brew club called the Wheeling Aylers. Uh, and we would do competitions with them. And we, we uh, it got to the point where we were seen as a single entity instead of two separate brewers. And that's where the, kind of like the, the concept of brewkeepers came from. We were, we were a group, a collective now. We weren't just two home brewers. We were now one brewing entity. And uh, when we got our first, we, we called it the six pack, the first six beers that we collaborated on, when we got those done, then we just started uh, doing public events, um, Ogilvy Institute stuff, uh, anywhere we could give away our beer, we did. And in that sense, people knew who we were and uh, started tasting our beer. They would come to these events and they would just line up and wait for our beer. That's how Brewfest still is. So, so, <laughs> so as the, line, the line's growing longer, was your feedback? Uh, Other stuff was good. You, Other people right, were enjoying well, it. I wanted all the feedback. I wanted good and bad. And, and, and I know it's really hard for a lot of people to, to say something negative about, like, to your face. Yeah, right to your face. <laughs> but that's the kind of honesty that I actually That's need. what you have Dave for. Right. That's, right. Well, <laughs> that's what I, that's what I hope everybody would be like. And, and I am glad that some people don't like our beer. And then I ask them why they don't like it. And if it's something that, that we can work on, then we will. If it's just because you don't like that style of beer, ah, sorry, I can't help you there. You know, that's an honest approach to business. There are a lot of entrepreneurs yeah, can, can learn from that to ask the question why. Uh, don't dismiss it right away. Make sure you figure out why they're they're making a comment like that before you say, okay, yeah, this is we don't need to listen to this, or, or maybe there's something to it. You know? yeah, last month we did a we did a uh, session just like this at Checker Spot Brewing in, in Baltimore, and the head brewer there is a lady named Judy Neff. Who has a uh, PhD in microbiology from Johns Hopkins, and her and her husband and a friend started this brewery. And she said, "You got to brew a lot as a home brewer." Uh, and she goes, "Everybody's going to tell you your beer is great." She goes, "You have to be very self-critical. You got you to critique your own beers. Absolutely. You got to mix it up with commercial brewers who will tell you, hey, yeah, Judy, it might need some of this, might need some of that. You need honest feedback to get better.' Yeah, right? Right. that's right. A, it's honest feedback is an honest approach to business too. It's yeah. not it's not putting on blinders and saying, you know. They are Wheeling's Leviathan of beer now, but they're not infallible, right? <laughs> no. you know, Did we get that? Leviathan, Leviathan Wheeling, of Leviathan of beer. I think and, I, you know, I so, might like to use that, actually. You know, <laughs> it, is, it is about constructive criticism, man, and how you take it. Uh, cause we, we always try to get our, you know, the people that follow us and uh, like what we do. We always ask questions, man. It's all, always about getting people involved. Sometimes, man, you know, it's... it's uh, They'll hit you with something, and but it's something that you absolutely have to soak in because who are you to just say no and turn, you know just not bring that to fruition? Well, actually, well, back in here, when you when you guys come up with a new design, you have a group of people that you you show it to and go, "What do you think of this?" Never. No. I mean, it's it's me and him, and and that's one of the things that I think makes our partnership pretty oh, good. Yeah. Is our back and forth, and you know, he'll I'll have an idea, or he'll have an idea, and we'll kind of we'll mold it together sometimes. Uh, to really get it to the best it, that it can be and you know two minds are always better than one uh, But we're not you know, we don't want to impress everyone We know that they're we're trying to put out something for everybody like there's there's usually something that on our site that one person will love and But we're not trying to do mass appeal kind of a thing 
it's, a, it's a great quote, and I don't know where it came from, but it said, if everybody's thinking the same thing, then someone's not thinking. So if, uh, every, so if everybody loves your, loves something, that's a, that's unusual. Um, so while with you guys, what, what's the in, where do you get the inspiration from? You know, other other than historical, lo, local themes, where do you get your inspiration for your designs? Both of us grew up here. Uh, I, I actually grew up right across the river. You can probably see my old house from here in Bridgeport, Ohio. But um, we frequented uh, downtown on I mean. We, a lot and growing up around here and especially being 37 seeing what it, the city was then like even when I was a child say 30 years ago to what it is now there's a lot of things that a lot of people had missed out on and then you you rewind even farther back man and there's a lot of great things that exist that you know, brought our city to life and brought it to uh, to where it just it breathed on its own and a lot of people just crave that Man, I so, mean that's essential. Well, we're talking about your city. What's the vibe like in Willing right now? Is it a creative city? Is it a city that's on the, the upswing? What's what's happening in Willing right now? Because frankly, you know, I'm gonna off, but but we travel to places that people don't tend to put at their top five of their their tourism list. Yeah. Places they're going to visit. I think when I talked on the phone the other day, I'm like, I want people to come to Wheeling. And, and maybe not go to Disney World this year and yeah. come and see, see what's happening in this small town. So, so why, why you've got a microphone and a camera in front of you, tell people what's happening here. That's easy. Uh, from an art standpoint and a creative standpoint, it is significantly different than it used to be. I left here to study art in a different state, in a different city, uh, because I, I honestly felt that it was dwindling. Uh, well, you know, in reference to the art community and things like that. And upon coming back and just kind of putting my head down and doing my own thing, uh, freelance and corporate jobs and such, by the time I put my head back up, this giant art community just rose out of nowhere. It's weird how things like that work. Art keeps the community going. It's always not something uh, you know, fresh and appealing to look at something from a different walk of life or a different take or perspective. Uh, to keep your eyes open like that, I think it's awesome. Also, I feel that right now, with the people that are actually running the city, are uh, they're forward forward thinkers, man. They're they're different than they were before, and there's a lot of things that are being built. And man, I'm just I don't know. I'm juiced to be a part of it, you know, because we are not only the nostalgic and old school take on the city. We also offer uh, there's you know there's a lot of new things as well, man. The, or as I said, a different way to look at something that you may have been familiar with, but in a different light. Yeah. So what about what about the food scene, Dave? And he's talking about the art. What's the food scene like? Yeah, the really? food scene's getting better. Uh, I mean, options in downtown were very limited, uh, even just a few years ago. I mean, there's there's yeah. within a block and a half uh, four new restaurants uh, in Wheeling than, that weren't here four years ago, five years ago. So I think. Before growth comes in any city that's trying to sort of regroup, food shows up first. The restaurants are always there first. I don't know what the reason is. Uh, you know, maybe trying to get ahead of trends. Uh, You've got to eat. As, as we were, but, you know, that seems to come first. But, you know, since then, there's been several re residential spaces developed in downtown Wheeling. The Mori Loss have been developed. I think it's... I don't know, 60 or 70 plus units, something, something like Those this. Those are nice too, man. Very Good nice, time. upscale, you know, people who are earning sustainable incomes are are the type of people that are living there instead of the subsidized housings that are sort of stood the test of time, if you will, in downtown Wheeling. So it's, it's nice to have younger people looking back at an urban footprint and developers looking at Wheeling as a place for potential with growth, for growth to develop this sort of residential spaces, right? And I think... That's going to be the big shift. That's going to be that's going to decide what the character of downtown really looks like. Is what type of people move in there, and what type of community is promoted around that growth and that movement to Wheeling? Because recently, the health plan built a building right across the street here, and it was the first new construction since like the '70s in downtown Wheeling, right? So that's a great sign. It's it is a great sign, sign and it's it's a big investment, um, and it's it's. Started a buzz, right? People are kind of, I don't want to say latching onto that, but people are kind of uh, gathering around that as sort of like a, a rallying cry, like, okay, 
This company, Williams Lee's been here for years and they're still growing fast. They've got 550 employees, it's a 24 seven operation. They occupy three floors in a, an old vacant department store that you know had gone out of business when we was on a decline. But uh, you know, that's a thousand employees. Then you go down to West Banco and they're continuing to grow. So we have these corporate entities that, you know, say what you will about big business, big business brings jobs, right? And, and for life to be sustained in an area, um, and to drive population density where it hasn't existed for 30 years and has only been on the decline, you know, for 50 to 60 years, um, you know, that's that's the way to do it, I think. So does the city or like the Chamber of Commerce here, do they, do they uh, promote festivals and events and stuff downtown to help like, drive traffic that would come to they the They do, they homes? welcome it. I wouldn't say they drive it, but they welcome it and they're very accommodating. If you want to put something on down there, they'll tell you exactly what you need to do, who you need to talk to, what can we do to help, can we shut streets down. Um, so I would say they're accommodating in that way and, and the people in the area of the area who want to promote things here or have doing, been doing things here for a long time like the Ohio, Ohio Valley, Upper Ohio Valley Italian Festival. Uh, it's like second or third biggest in the nation. Yeah. It's been going on for years, right? Uh, but it's it's traditions like that and the new traditions like Ohio Valley Pride coming and they want you know to, to raise awareness, things like that. Um, that are driving that. It's, it's these outside forces, but the city couldn't be more accommodating, I would say. So about beer, beer Josh, do you have any craft beer festivals that happen here in Wheeling? Well, we have one. <laughs> and if there's not one, we need to start one. No, it's, it's <laughs> definitely one. It's every, every uh, it's always the second Saturday or third Saturday second in August. Saturday in yeah. August yeah. Second Saturday in August. Um, it started, what, five years ago, maybe? Yeah, it's been pretty recent. Yeah, I would say five's close. Yeah, and uh, you know, we participated for, uh, for the past three, of course. What'd you get? Did you win anything? We get. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and why is it going to be so competitive? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've gotten people's choice every year that we've uh, we've entered, and we've we've placed in the beer competition every year that we've entered too. Uh, That's killer stuff. First place, top two years, right? Judges' choice, top two. Uh, uh, first two years. See your PR guy. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah. So, um, and, and it, it's it's all like West Virginia beers and stuff like that. And I mean, I I do appreciate us like winning these things, but I mean, I almost think it's sort of like I feel like it's uh, almost a gimme because it's our town, you know. But I mean, well, that's, that's me being self-critical. But you, that's you know, humility, that. dude. That's but what it's stuff, but man. Do you, that's see, do you see these beer fests as a competition or more of a celebration of the craft brewing industry? You and all your brethren here in West Virginia, what you're doing? Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I I, I think it's uh, it's it's definitely more like uh, I don't view it as a competition. I just like that. Actually, the sort of I like the I camaraderie <laughs> between the brewers, you know, I talk to all the local, like all the West Virginia guys when I go there. I, I, I try to go to almost every booth and introduce myself and, and then talk to everybody and, and uh, exchange ideas, exchange exactly. beers and stuff like that. Do you find that that uh, people in the craft brew industry are extremely open and giving and are willing to, to share information about how they do things and, and you guys likewise? In, um, Generally, yes. Yeah. I, I do believe that. Um, now, I can, well, I'll tell you everything you want to know about our beer, except on how to make it, you know? Like, and, and I always keep our proprietary secrets. Oh, absolutely. You know, like, mm. but, but yeah, I, I love answering questions. I, well, I like, I like that people are interested. And um, I like to educate whenever I can, because there's lots, of, there's lots of falsehoods about beer out there, things that people think they know. Um, <laughs> I saw a billboard that said, uh, beer and weed leads to meth. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. No, heroin. Heroin. <laughs> heroin? <laughs> but there's you know, one of something, because a lot of people, what they think they know, we have this conversation all the time with people, is there's a million and one home brewers out there. Sure. And they're all like, oh, my beer's good. I could, I could open my own craft brewery. Oh, it's not And I go, hey, no, you couldn't. <laughs> you know, it's there's not there's so much to it. Yeah. Um, Plus, you can't run a brewery on one beer. No. Absolutely can't work not on, anymore, anyway. on one, not anymore anyway. Um, but for you guys, from the time you decided that we're going to try to do this for a living, how long did it take you to get from that point to the doors are open and we're producing beers, we're selling them, we have customers? Um, almost, almost, I guess, four years. Uh, yeah. we, we formed our LLC first. 
and that was the first thing that we did. We kept so, the so you're telling me there's a business side to this too. It's oh, yeah. not just putting good liquid in a barrel. Yeah, there's, there's more business <laughs> than I'd like to admit, but you know, uh, but I, that's that's why you know uh, Carolyn is really important to us. She actually got us through <laughs> most of the paperwork because. <laughs> I can't do that. It's rough, that. dude. Right. Yeah, I, man. I, 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 I'll admit, oh. I'll admit with, without Kevin and Carolyn, I just, I just don't be ten a bar. You know, because I just, I don't know how to put that kind of stuff together. Now I'm, I'm learning as much as I can, as fast as I can about, you know, opening new business stuff like that. Because I, I'd like to open a distillery here eventually. Um, but so I, I'm trying to learn as much as I can. But it, right out of the gate, uh, I was just, I was ignorant about how to start something like this. I had no idea. I mean, I knew I know how to make the product, and I know enough people that I can distribute the product. But the uh, legality, red tape, everything like that, I'm just like, it's it's daunting. The stacks of paper you got to go through, you know, uh, all the all the laws that that, that you have to, uh, you know, adhere to, and stuff like that. Like it's just it's 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 nuts. It's hard. It's really hard for especially young people to do this. You know, we're ill-equipped in general. To do this, um, we needed, we, and so we needed like some sort of encouragement or some kind of like push out the door, so to speak, uh, because they don't they don't teach kids in school how to open a business. No, they, don't. they just don't. So when somebody opens a business, especially a young person, they usually take on too much, or they didn't do enough. You know, so finding that that middle ground is the most important thing I think you can you do to prepare yourself for what's coming, you know. But, uh, but by and large, I'm just so happy I had smarter people than me. With me. <laughs> so, 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 so shifting to the creative production side, away from the business side, what what are some of the, the most popular beers that Brewkeepers produces today? Um, our flip-flop West Coast IPA is our number one. Um, it, I think... Us. I, in short... <laughs> I think it's our number one because uh, as IPAs go, usually um, they're cr- like crushingly bitter or they're too sweet or blah, blah, blah. You know, there's something that's too much, too much, too much. Uh, so our idea behind the flip-flop was to make it as balanced, as smooth as possible, you know. So it's, there's, there's, no, there's nothing competing for flavor or bitterness or, you know. Everything is just, it plays its own role and it's a nice ride, start to finish. And that's our number one. So our number two beer is uh, Ye Old Ale, which is featured at the Ye Old Alpha. And the funny, funny thing about that beer is that was our very first beer that we sold. The very first account was at the Ye Old Alpha. And we were, when we, I never thought we'd go this fast, but the first two and a half weeks or three weeks that we had that beer, they were averaging a keg every like two hours. Wow. Holy hell. Yeah, and it was all we could do to keep up with that demand. The first, like, th- what, three months that we were open, all we were doing, basically all we were doing was trying to make that one beer. So, so prior to you guys opening your doors, who, who was kicking out good craft beer and wheeling? Nope. Good answer. So you, so, so you, so you, were, you, were, the, you were the answer to, to like, hardcore well, beer drinkers' prayers and wheeling wasn't All right, beer. well, there's, um, there's a, another brewery called Wheeling Brewing Company, of course you know. Uh, their whole thing was, like, like the brew pub. Like, you go there, you sit down, you eat something, you have a pint. We wanted to mainly be a distributor before we did anything else, build our brand, yeah. uh, uh, well, make money, you know? Yeah. It was all right, man. We had bills to pay. So, so, so paying the bills is important. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially if you're poor, right? Yeah, especially if you're poor. That's right. You know? <laughs> but, so, so, yeah, we were, um, we just decided to uh, kind of be a service to Wheeling instead of being an attraction in Wheeling. Uh, but now, we're gonna, hopefully, we're going to be getting a tap open soon, and now will be that destination as well. I was just going to say, so your initial focus wasn't to be a destination brewery. It was to be a provider of, of, of good beers, quality beers to the neighborhood. Well, we had we had a few different things we could try, and so we had, like, this is brewery A, this is brewery B, this is brewery C. So depending on, like, um, how much capital we could get, for our loans would kind of dictate right. what type of brew we were going to be. So we, we could be a brew club, could be a distributor, or we could, you know. Uh, so we decided to take the distribution on, and it actually worked out way better than if we would have opened a brew club of our own. You know. 
Burn to see if you can talk with a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, Kish was getting really close. So I had him, I, I had him make, just make you guys well. a bunch of tacos. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, so sliding over here to Wheeling Threads, what, what can we look for from you guys in, in the near future? What are your plans as far as growth? Maybe maybe a, a retail site? What, what's oh, kicking we're, in the future? Uh, we're, I'm running for mayor, man. No. <laughs> no, no, uh, no politics. Don't do that. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to stick to our, you know, what we're both good at. What to expect. Uh, last year, you know, when he was referencing the festivals and things like that, uh, we did our first event, and that was the Upper Ohio Valley uh, Italian Her Heritage Festival. Didn't know what to, what to take of it, you know, because we had only been an online presence, so everybody that followed us and liked our products and everything, they were like, juice to come see us. I, I was like, I don't know, man. I've never been a part of anything like this. And uh, they blew our hair back, man. I mean, we were just like devastated after that week. It's just like, I can't move. <laughs> oh my God, this is insane. Uh, it hurts and, so good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and we just, we kind of took that feeling and ran. And so what we're doing now, instead of, we don't want to put the horse before the buggy and getting a brick and mortar because, I don't know, you know, what happens if it doesn't work out? So we're taking the slow road. And by slow road, that's not really what I mean. Uh, more events, more face-to-face uh, -face interaction, especially with what Dave had uh, had come up with with uh, Small Business Saturday. For, you know, businesses like ours that don't have brick and mortars have them post up at the restaurant. And that was our first experience like that, our very first pop-up shop. So you guys did a pop-up here at Taco Hall just, Saturday. just a few days ago. Yeah. Right? I was, and that went well, I hear. Yeah, it was, <laughs> not only was it a lot of fun, tacos and beer, but there were, it, the the turnout was, it was wild, you know. There's things that you kind of expect, you know, in your head, like, modest approaches, you know, with how things will turn out. And it, it overshadowed everything that we had previously had in mind, and it was just awesome, man. Been meeting a lot of new people, a lot of, uh, you know, we have some regulars that stop by and such that, you know, always take care of us and things like that. But I just really like the, the interaction, man. People come up, they have questions like, what do you do? Well, glad you asked, what don't we do? <laughs> um, <clears throat> you get to dive into a lot of the history and things like that. And they always ask, you know, who does the arts? Well, we do. Well, where's your storefront? Well, Buster Brown, you're looking at it. You're looking at it, yeah. You know? And uh, it's just, it's, it's. It's about, super cool, man. So we're just trying to up the ante this year. So what about you, Ashley? Do you find these kind of pop-up events and stuff and exciting? Get your Absolutely. juices flowing? Absolutely. Um, I think there's a lot to be said because in this day and age, there's a, a lot of online shopping. You know, people want to shop from their couches and they want to not leave the house necessarily. Uh, but doing something a little bit exclusive for people that will come out to these events and purchase things. We have, you know, some product that we only sell at events that we don't oh, sell yeah. on our website. And you know, yep. that gets people kind of excited. And I'm one of those, once I see it, I have to have it kind of people. That I want to touch the product, I want it right then and there, I don't want to wait for shipping, and, and that kind of thing. So I think that says a lot, like that's helped us yeah. as far as our events go. We try to make it special, that way people don't just take the product for granted. Like, you can't go to a prints online, or stickers, buttons, and so on. You know, we want to keep these, we keep it as fresh as possible, keep people interested. Like I said, people just come out of the woodwork. Nobody wants to leave their house at the end of July, it's hot. But they do, and they came to see us, and man, it was pretty righteous. Yeah, and as Rick pointed out, the pop-up works well because people like to buy t-shirts when they're drinking, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it works well, man, I'm telling you. People like to buy everything when they're drinking. He's like this stealth intellect. He absolutely yeah, he is, man. He's taking it all in, and he's, he's piling up the, the one-liners, and then he just unleashes them, and they're all killer. But I'll throw this out to the table, though, because an observation that I have in my travels, and we travel a lot, is that there, there's kind of a, a, I'm going to call it a backlash, but a pushback against like social media and the online and ordering everything online. And people are starting to want to like talk to people again. Yeah, and, it's and weird how that do, works, right? Do you yeah. sense here in Wheeling that a community is starting to grow that, that wants to come out to a pop-up at Tacoholics yeah. and try their beers and look at, your, look at your wares and try their tacos? Do you feel it building here? Yeah, uh, there's no question about it. And which that's what's so surprising about that. Um, I knew it would be a great thing. I, I absolutely did, especially with the food and the beer. But you, you know, you throw some solid artwork in the mix as well. Um, I, exactly what you said. You're building a community that, that is focused on things like that. People, 
are really starting to enjoy like interaction again. Man, what a time to be alive. Yeah. I you know think I, mean? I think we got to a lot of, a lot more of the cross pollination from the cross marketing, if you will. Yeah. We got people. I got some people that I've never seen and I'm here all the time. And I think you guys did too, right? Absolutely. So yeah. that, that's the whole the whole purpose of the Pop-Up series is to kind of spread the love and you know let these businesses intermingle and their customers as well intermingle and see if there's anything that your customers want from my business and anything that my customers want from your business. It was super and that's, cool. And that's the, the, the beautiful part about it. As odd as this is going to sound, we're trying to take the local cross-pollination to a national level. We, we want people, as they're driving out I-70, passing through, and I'll repeat that, through Wheeling, they're not stopping here. They're going somewhere else. Because you're, you're perceived as, well, that's, I've heard of Wheeling. That's yeah. kind of a place they pass through on the way to some place they think Consistently, is pretty, yeah, prettier. Dude. We want them to go, Hey, well, remember that podcast where those guys were talking about the killer tacos and the great beer? And maybe we should pull off here. Yeah, um, thanks, bro. We're, we're trying to take the local vibe that you guys are building, the local community, and expose it to everybody <laughs> else in the country. And when they leave their town, they go, Let's, maybe we should stop in Willie. Maybe there's something cool. So get those tunnels open under City Hall. Yeah, so buddy. Yeah. People people <laughs> down there. No, it's, it's a big idea, but I think it works. You know, if you keep the, the communities close enough together, like you're, you were, I don't know where you just were, but you're going to Columbus. That's, you know, right. hour and a half, two hours away. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it does have that potential. Kind of build, build a little a little web nationwide. Yeah, the grid, right? It's where the, it's the CNF grid. The, C, the CNF grid. We'll call it the grid. We'll call it you know the dark web. <laughs> the matrix. Like, as long as Don't it's need filled, the blue pill. As long, right? as, yeah. as long as it's filled with cool people, call it whatever you want. Um, so as we as we wrap this up, and any, any thoughts you'd like to share with people about wheeling and what it's like to, to crank up a business here? Um. It's, well, I think any entrepreneur um, would, would agree that it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. No, but I think it's like the but perfect place too, yeah. though. Well, a, a place like this, we're actually, we're, we're on like a revival almost. Yeah. Where we were done yeah. doing nothing but dying for years here. And people would leave because there's nothing to do here, but there's nothing to do because you leave. You know, you don't stay in the country. Well, yeah. what, what turned around the dime? What do you think it was that turned the ship and everybody said, you know what, let's try to make something here? Uh, I think it was, um, well, our generation. We just, yeah, we re just, revolution, man. Yeah. I think we it were started just, with a lot of like minded people yeah, all doing the same right. thing at the same time, and then we just started building like these connections and relationships and helping each other. Young you, people are you, coming you back. Say your generation, you guys are all in your 30s? Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm way older than you, but it seems to me, and the millennial generation takes a lot of crap from a lot of people for a lot of reasons, but it seems like you guys have this certain ethos where you're like, you know, I don't want to really be in a corporate job. I don't want to be sitting in a cubicle wearing a suit. This is what I'm really interested in doing. This is what I'm going to do. And then here's Dan Nash over here, and they're doing what they want to do. And Josh is doing what he wants to do. And you all meet each other, and it just kind of builds on itself. You're absolutely until, right. Until people are here going... I want to make money, I want to have a good life, but money isn't everything. Mm -hmm. and I, I want to have a life where I can interact with these other people who are all being genuine and true to themselves and doing what they're called to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, sorry, I, 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 I think that um, our country in general has this like, corporate mentality, um, or at least it has for a long time. You know, uh, big business is good, you know, big business is equal success, money, money, money. Um, and I think that we're kind of retreating from that saying that you don't have to make a, a million bucks a year. To be yeah, happy. really, man. It's just do what you like doing and, you know, be part of your community. I just want to be able to buy groceries. You right. know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm not asking to be Oprah. I don't need a bunch of cars and stuff. You know what I mean? You got it. Should I start your own network? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in on yours because I spend, and this isn't about me, but I'll just share some thoughts, 35 years just nose to the grindstone, building business, building a business. Um, straight up, making a significant six-figure salary every year, but the past 18 months since I sold it, the most fun I've ever had. So it, is, it isn't all about the money. Yeah, it's life. about meeting people like you guys who are out here sitting here telling me, "Hey, I always wanted to open a restaurant, so damn it, I did it. Yeah. I grew to love brewing beer, so I'm doing it. You know what? Hey, we're both really good artists, and this is what we want to do, so we're doing. It. Um, and sharing your stories with the whole country is what we want to do. Because I want somebody sitting, literally, somebody six months from now sitting in Santa Fe, going, "Hell yeah." They're doing it. I'm going to do it, too. Yeah. Because I think that's how we're getting better. And like you said earlier, I don't want to demean big business. It has its place. But, but folks, anybody who sees this or is listening to this, your life is local. 
The yeah. next time there's a disaster, the people who are going to help you first are your neighbors, not, yeah. not FEMA or somebody a thousand miles away. You know, I, so uh, you know, go out and support your local businesses. And I, I made a post in regards to that with um, where Dave's wife made us all take that photo on Saturday. It was Dave, the popcorn, popcorn shop, Dave, yeah. not this Dave. Yeah. No. <laughs> I don't know where Dave I am right now. the street where it says, mmm, popcorn. Yeah. And <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, it's true. 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 Talkaholics, Dave at mm, Yeah, we'll send you in the stuff. bag. Yeah, yeah, for you'll, sure. you'll buy it, you'll <laughs> so buy it next it, time. It was Ashley and I, and it was Dave, and it was uh, your twin, Thomas Gilson, did with the, uh, <laughs> with the cheese melts, and it was Dave from Popcorn, and you know, made us pose in this photo, Grant, and I did a ridiculously, ridiculous face, because that's, I can't help myself. How could you, you not? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, it got shared a couple of times. I looked at it. I was like, man, this is righteous, dude. You know, you, you have all these business owners, people that are actually enjoying themselves under one roof. And basically what I said is it's not about pitting yourself against somebody else because, you know, sometimes when the brakes wear off, it, it, it is like those are going to be the people that help you. Right. So, man, yeah, perfectly said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's driving true, man. Yeah, philosophically, we're all in the same boat. You you shared uh, I don't know if you want to call it an analogy or not, but on the phone, I spoke first time I spoke to you, I was skeptical. I was like, this guy's offering a free trip. It's a scam, right? Just it's off the gate. Scam. That's what it is. I mean, this, I can't help it. Sorry, no, yeah. no disrespect, but uh, that's I, I, I understand. First, it. Yeah, first of all, it's I don't, a scam. I don't, and, and well, go ahead, finish your yeah, comment. So the, 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 the analogy was that uh, people will be wearing uh, keeping it local T-shirt that has a local business on it and have two packages sitting on their porch from Amazon, right? I get it. Amazon's the cheapest. Like, they, they lose money to gain market share. I get it. It's brilliant in a capitalist society. But if there's a natural, natural disaster or if your house burns down, is Amazon going to invite you in? I mean, I, you know, they won't even let their, their workers uh, go to the bathroom. You think they're going to offer you a place oh, when, when yeah. your house burns down? Yeah. I like to tell people, think about these three words. Cheaper, easier, better. Does cheaper make it better? No, one no, doesn't belong. Does, does, right. does yeah. easier make it better? Yeah. And uh, I don't know about you, your parents, but back in the day, my parents would say, you get out of something what you put into it. Yeah. Sure. So easier means you put less into it. Why do you expect more out of it? Right. So uh, better requires effort. It infers quality. It infers a certain level of in integrity and dignity and work ethic that I think your generation is starting to bring back, and I'm saluting you for it. So everybody listening and watching this podcast, get your asses to Wheeling, West Virginia. <laughs> drink some great beer. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, man, man. Great beer. Yeah. Eat some really good tacos. Wear some fine Wheeling Threads clothing. And stop in and meet these good people. And until next time, this is Rick Carter with Dave and Josh and Ashley and Dan. And we are in freaking Wheeling, West Virginia. Have a good day. <laughs>